Hello, everyone. Um, today's lecture um, and the final lecture of the supplement program uh, will be on the skin. Right, the skin is, you know, is the largest organ. But before you answer that, again, my information um, along with my email, if you ever want to get in contact with me, again, I also recommend you join the group me. It's an easy way to get a hold of me and the other tutors, as well as any updates or anything that we may have. Um, especially now that we're finishing this program, if we do launch any other programs or do anything else with um, the MCAT program, um, that's where you'll find this information most likely. Learning objectives first, what is the function of the skin? Um, what is the composition of the layers of the skin? How does skin help in thermal regulation? What are other methods of thermal regulation that don't involve the skin? And what are hair and nails uh, mainly used for? They're not part of the skin, but usually they're, they're very closely related. Okay, on to the content. First, the layers. So overview of the layers. So we have the epidermis, the dermis, and the, sub uh, the subcutaneous uh, tissue. So the epidermis is the thinnest and the outermost layer it contains uh, most of your pigments and it's essentially like the barrier, the first barrier, because um, it wraps around your entire body, mostly. Um, next is the dermis, which is the biggest and thickest layer, it contains nerve endings, oil and sweat glands, and hair follicles, and the subcutaneous, which is made up of fat, tissue, tissue, larger blood vessels, things like that. And then right under that would be your muscle. Okay. Starting with the epidermis, the outermost layer, uh, it's essentially the barrier or the shield for our body against the outside world. So the first line of defense we always have uh, against bacteria, viruses, microbes, by acting as a physical barrier. When say a bacteria or virus comes close to you, it lands on your skin, like on your arm, and it gets trapped on your skin, then you take a shower or wash your hands or whatever, and it washes it right and the bacteria never even gets the chance to go inside and actually harm the cells, which is where the pathogen can actually hurt us. You know that, um, especially now, uh, over the last couple of years is very important, um, washing hands because that's how you get things off your skin and don't touch your face because things might end up on your skin, which acts as a shield, but then you touch your mouth, touch your nose, touch your eyes, anything like that, and everything from your skin can go inside and that's how you get sick and that's where um, it can hurt us. Okay, this layer also protects us from radiation, namely UV radiation from the sun. It's also what determines your skin color based on the number of melanin producing melanocytes present in this layer. So the more you have, obviously, the more uh, pigmentation you have in your skin. And that's why if you, because it's meant to, the melanin is meant to protect your skin against um, UV radiation. Um, if you were exposed to a lot of UV radiation, say you were going on vacation and you went like sunbathing, um, you'd end up getting tan, um, which is a darker skin color. And that's because um, the, the number of uh, melanocytes are increasing because there's a higher demand for it. And this also is why people from those like tropical areas that do get a lot of sunlight uh, radiation tend to be, uh, have darker pigmentation in their skin than people who are from like snowy or Northern or really Southern countries um, where they don't have such a need for protection against UV radiation. Okay, next is the dermis. So this layer is where we have all our sweat glands, nerve endings, hair follicles, it's the biggest of the three layers, um, like size-wise thickness. Um, sweat glands and hair are both very important for temperature regulation for humans, which we'll cover later on in this lecture as I mentioned, um, but you know that um, they are located in this layer. Nerve endings in the skin are also uh, located here and they're obviously very important. Touch is one of our main senses. Pain, uh, pressure, temperature sensors, among others, are found in this layer of skin. And they allow us to observe the qualities of things around us in ways that you wouldn't otherwise uh, be able to. Like, for example, um, you can know if something is hot or cold by touching it because you have in your dermis um, temperature sensors. You can't like see or hear or smell that something is hot or cold. Um, just like you can't see or hear or smell that something is sharp or that it's round or that it's smooth or rough or things like that. And that's all because you have like pressure sensors, pain sensors, temperature sensors in your skin. These are all very important because obviously things that are sharp can pierce you. So you want pain sensors that are telling you there's something touching your skin that's very sharp. Stop before it like pierces through you, especially if it's like on your chest or in like somewhere that's important. It'll tell you stop before you get your insides hurt or if you're touching them that's hot. They'll tell you that's hot, get your hand off, 
before you burn yourself and you like lose your ability to use your hand or something like that. Okay. Next is the subcutaneous layer, which is the innermost layer of the skin. It's a layer which contains most of our fat, connective tissue, and many of the blood vessels. Um, fat and blood vessels also have many functions, and one of which um, is thermal regulation, which we'll again we'll cover later. And it has many, many more, but you don't really have to know that. And like a lot of the blood vessels um, functions we've already covered in different lectures so far, like the circulatory system. Um, fat we've also covered. It's mainly used for storage of energy, which we covered in a lot of our glycolysis and ATP synthesis um, lectures. Okay, and this is again the final layer before the muscle starts. And this is kind of a more diagram, just like I showed you before, showing the three layers and kind of showing you the things that are found inside again. This third layer, at the bottom here, is, this is where your fat is, this is where your uh, veins, uh, blood artery, arteries and veins are, your blood vessels, sorry. And um, so this is the middle layer, the, the dermis. Again, this is where hair starts. This is where you have um, these sweat glands and a lot of these uh, nerve endings right here, right? And this is a capillary bed, but this is what I'm talking about. Um, and again, this is the outermost layer, which is mainly just like a barrier. And obviously the hair goes all the way through. Okay. All right, next let's talk about thermal regulation. We've alluded to it um, multiple times. Skin has many mul multiple roles in thermal regulation. Sweating, hair, fat, blood vessels. These are all ways that humans at least can control um, thermal regulation, sorry. Thermal regulation varies among the species, is, species and especially among different groups. So, so for example, mammals regulate completely differently than birds, which are different than reptiles and insects. Um, first, cold blood versus hot blood, some even don't regulate, like for example, reptiles. Um, but even among hot blooded um, animals, it varies greatly. Like, like, you know, some like birds don't have hair, they have feathers, um, so they can't use hair. Um, certain animals have different compositions of fat, um, they have different uh, sizes, so blood vessels may not be close to their body, um, or they may be actually closer to their body, so like, some, like worms. Um, maybe could use blood vessels more, or insects actually use um, blood vessels a little bit more. Um, and we'll talk about sweating. Not every animal sweats, even among mammals. Some animals don't sweat. That's actually what we're going to talk about right now. So sweating is one of the way, main ways humans cool the body off to prevent overheating. Humans release water from sweat glands in the dermis layer, along mixed in with some, um, like as some, some sodium and other uh, minerals in it as well, but mostly it's just water. Um, water is a very good conductor of heat, meaning that heat travels very well through water. So the sweat absorbs the heat from the body in order to evaporate. So you essentially cover yourself in water, and then that water draws in the heat from inside your body. And when it gets heated enough, it'll evaporate, right? But mainly until it evaporates, it's constantly absorbing the heat from the body. And so the, the heat's not in your body, it's now going out. By absorbing the heat, it lowers the temperature of the body and sends it into the atmosphere when it evaporates. Sorry about that. Other than humans and apes, um, few, very few animals actually sweat. Um, cats and dogs sweat a little bit through their paws, um, like the tips of their paws, like the over here. Uh, but mainly, they actually uh, use panting uh, and release heat through the water on their tongue. So it's a very similar idea, except they do it through the mouth. Uh, specifically through their tongue, where they release water onto the tongue, and then their tongue absorbs the water, the heat from their body, and then evaporates. And this is what makes specifically the ability to sweat and sweat a lot. So it makes humans, apes, horses, great endurance runners, especially humans, um, compared to uh, other animals like dogs and cats. Um, they can't really run for a very long time. Um, so even though a dog or a cat is very fast, it they, they don't tell you that they actually end up stop having to stop. Uh, very rapidly. Uh, they can't keep running for a long time because they start to overheat and they have to stop to pant because they can't pant while running, whereas we can sweat while running. Um, they have to stop and they have to pant and kind of cool off before they can continue again. If not, they'll overheat. Okay. 
Next up is hair and fat. Hair and fat, both very important for insulation to prevent hypothermia. So sweat is to cool off when it's really hot. Hair and fat mostly used to um, warm up when it's cold. The natural flow of heat is always from hot to cold, but these insulators have a lot of resistance for heat transfer and prevent it from leaving the body when it's cold outside. So when it's cold outside, normally if you had no fat, no hair, essentially the heat would just go down its uh, gradient from your hot body, which is 98 degrees, to the cold outside, which is much less, which is like 20 degrees or 30 degrees or however many, however many degrees it is outside. And it would essentially leave your body and you would freeze to death because you, you're, all the temperature and all the heat would leave your body and then go to the outside. And so your body would be too cold. Um, what happens is this hair and this fat, it acts as an insulator. It doesn't let the heat, even though the gradient is still there, it increases the resistance and prevents as much heat from going through. Basically it makes it really hard for the heat to move, right? The, the heat wants to move because there's a gradient, but it can't move because it's physically very hard for it because there's hair and fat in the way. Um, in addition to the insulated, insulative properties of fat, brown fat is especially good for thermal regulation when it's cold, when white fat, it's, which is what mostly you have in your body, white fat is burned. It mainly provides a lot of energy with a little bit of heat, which is usually what we want um, because that's the purpose of fat. It's, it's energy storage. So when you burn it, you want to make a lot of energy and you don't really want to have heat. Brown fat is inefficient combustion, meaning that when it gets burned by the body, it produces very little energy, but a lot of heat because all of the energy is leaving in the form of heat. So it's energy we can't use uh, by the body. But when it's cold outside, obviously you don't care about energy. You wanna make some heat. So brown fat's good when it's really cold outside. You can burn it and get a lot of heat. Adults have a relatively low amount of brown fat compared to white fat, but infants and like very young children, they have a lot more brown fat as they rely more on it for heating than adults. Because like we mentioned with like shivering and other things, um, kids don't really have, uh, like infants don't really have as much of that, so they rely more on brown fat. Okay, next up, let's talk about blood vessels and thermal regulation. So there's vasoconstriction and vasodilation. Vasoconstriction is the narrowing of blood vessels, which occurs when it's cold outside to prevent hypothermia, um, similar to the, the hair and fat. Obviously, the amount of heat transfer is inversely proportional to the distance between the transfer points. So if you had a temperature gradient, um, say my body and the window over there, and it's cold outside, obviously my the heat from my body is not really gonna go to the, the window outside. One, because there's obviously like a lot of insulation between there, especially in the air. But in addition, it's also because it's like very difficult to go a long distance. Um, so increasing distance will reduce the heat transfer. That's essentially what basal, um, constriction does is, so imagine this is your skin, let me draw in purple. So you have purple skin, say, then you have these red blood vessels, right? And it's a tube. And this is the outside world, it's cold. This is like the air, yes. And it's cold outside. So the heat, which I'll draw in black, is going from here to here, right? It's cold outside, so the heat is going this way. What vasoconstriction does is, so still you have your purple skin, um, and then your blood vessels now, they decrease in size. So now they are much thinner, like this. Okay, and it's now again going from here to here, right? But look, the distance from here to here is now greater than the distance from here to here, right? You can see that this is bigger than this, right? So this distance a lot more because it got constricted. So it used to be like this, now it's like this. So it means that it has less distance to the outside or more distance to the outside, sorry. Meaning that because um, there's more distance, less heat transfer. Vasodilation is the opposite. Vasodilation is the widening and it's used um, when it's hot outside, because you want to increase heat transfer. Again, purple skin, red. Again, you want to go from here to here. 
right? But when vasodilation occurs, you have this, it widens, becomes a lot thicker. This is my, like obviously a much more extreme example, but like just showing you thickens, gets wider, less distance, more heat transferred to the outside world. Because again, heat gradient is going from inside your body to outside. Um, vasoconstriction in addition to being, um, so in addition to the, what I mentioned where it increases distance to the outside world, um, vasoconstriction also reduces your blood flow to the appendages. So your fingers, your feet, your toes, things like that, in order to keep the core warmer, right? Because if it goes to your fingers, the fingers, if like the blood, which has all, the, which has most of the heat will go through your hands, arms, it'll go to your fingers and it'll just go right out from your fingers to the outside world, it's very easy. Whereas if you instead heat, blood goes from here to your arm right here, then it stops at your like wrist and then it actually transfers the heat back through the artery, uh, from, back through the vein, sorry. It goes through the artery and then it travels back through the vein, goes back and then back to your core. The heat doesn't go to your fingers, which is why your fingers feel very cold, but that's because um, if it was to go to your fingers, it would just go right out. Your whole body would get colder. Whereas now your middle part is still same warm, but your fingers are just not getting the blood flow. So they're not allowing you to go out, staying right here centered essentially. Um, and what that does is um, that makes your fingers and feet and toes feel very cold. And those are the first things that feel cold, but your core in exchange uh, gets to keep being warm. Right. And um, with vasodilation, again, it does the opposite. So it can increase blood flow and actually um, vasodilation also can lower blood pressure, right? Because if the um, blood vessels are wider, obviously less pressure. So uh, vasodilation can also lower blood pressure and vasodilator medications can also be commonly prescribed for high blood pressure. That's another use of, I guess, vasodilation other than. Um, then thermal regulation can also be used, and it is medically used um, for high blood pressure. Okay, now let's talk about hair and nails. Composition. So both hair and nails are composed of a molecule called uh, keratin, which is a hardened protein. So remember that it's very important. It's a protein. Okay, so you're immediately thinking it's, it's made up of amino acids, that's a long chain has a primary, secondary, and tertiary structure at least, plastoid quaternary. The secondary structure of the protein keratin is a coiled coil, which is a combination of two twisted alpha helices. Usually they're bonded together strongly with disulfide bonds, which remember are between cysteine and cysteines, the SS bonds, so disulfide, and such a coiled coil, which looks like this. Um, it's kind of uh, hard to find a picture, a good picture of it online, I think. Um, but essentially it's like a coil coil is like that, like that. And, um, and remember it has this, uh, it's, I'm trying to draw 3D, but like, you can't really like see it. Imagine it's going like this, like here, right? And coil coils, what's important to know about them, they do have a repeating uh, amino acid residue. Uh, seven amino acids, it's a pseudo repeat. Um, positions one and four usually have uh, hydrophobic residue. So this could be any one of the nonpolar res um, any of the nonpolar residues. So say, um, I don't know, like glycine or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. Um, any of the hydrophobic residues like tryptophan or anything like that. Um, and the rest aren't really important, but know that it is one to seven and four, one and four have this hydrophobic residues. And that's because they're usually stacked on top of each other, as you can see. Again, hard to see because it's 3D, but imagine these are like tankly like stacked on top of each other. Yeah, so that's why they have hydrophobic uh, pores. And if um, you have any questions, I recommend looking at this. So you can um, use this link, um, kind of copy it, right? Or you can just look up this post of my, uh, Leonard McKenzie and you can look up this, um, this lecture about the coiled coil. Um, I think it's very helpful in explaining some of this. Okay. 
Next, let's talk about piloerection, which is something that um, hairs undergo. So hairs have muscles attached to them, which is something you may not have known. Um, your hairs have a muscle known as erector pili or hair erectors. Um, erector pili is, is just Latin for hair erectors. Um, when these muscles are contracted, they cause the hair to stand on end, and we commonly refer to this as goosebumps. Formerly, it's known as piloerection. So literally, your hair kind of when the muscles contract, it just stands up, okay? It can be a response to cold or fear or some other stimuli. Um, sometimes you just get random goosebumps for no reason. Um, this could be because of like cold or fear, or again, any other stimulus. Um, it's not very well understood, but so somewhat well understood, I guess. Mild thermoregulation function is it increases the air in between the hairs, which acts even stronger, insulated than normally keeps heat in. I can draw a picture of this. So again, uh, sorry, where's my uh, purple skin? So you have the purple skin and you have black hairs going through it. And so you have some that are like standing up and then some that are not. The ones that are not standing up, and I'll draw um, say blue arrows, okay? The heat goes from inside your skin to the outside. Again, I mentioned hair is kind of like an um, insulator. So it will not let the, the heat go through as easily. But when the hair stands up on ends like this, like you can see right here, there's actually, and I'll draw this um, in light blue. There's actually like a lot of air right here. That's essentially trapped in your hair. So there's a lot of air. And um, what's worse insulator than keratin or the hair itself, is actually air. Air is a terrible insulator. I mean, it's a, it's a great insulator. It's a terrible conductor of heat. Air um, doesn't let heat go through pretty much at all. So when it tries, it'll kind of slow down a lot here and it won't get out because there's a lot of hair, because there's a lot of air. Okay. And that's like the main function that we know of for uh, goosebumps or piloerection. Um, Hair, obviously, um, the muscles, the erector pili are also very important for the structure of hair, for keeping hair um, kind of like uh, structured the way it is with, with it being like long. Um, but this is another function that it has. Okay. That was quick, kind of a quick uh, lecture because there's not really much to say. Um, skin mainly it functions as a defense mechanism. So it's part of the immune system actually um, because it is kind of like a guardian. And uh, it has a lot of thermal regulation functions with the fat, the sweat glands, and all of these things, the hair, um, all of this, um, the thermal regulation goes through. Okay. So thank you very much for joining. Like I mentioned, this is actually the last uh, lecture for the supplement. If you guys have any questions, um, please feel free to check out the group me or send me an email, which is um, located right here. Um, thank you very much for tuning in and um, hope to see you guys. Um, and the next program we run. Right. Have a great day.